that I'm the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at Grand Rapids Community College. I'm proud to say that because tonight I not only have the honor of introducing Isabel Wilkerson, the distinguished keynote speaker in GRCC's 2011 Race and Ethnicity Conference, I also have the honor of recognizing the GRCC faculty who started this conference in 2009 and who have made it one of the premier academic events here at GRCC every year since then. These are the faculty of the Social Sciences Department, and I'm going to ask them to please stand. And they'll humor me by doing it. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs> in this and in past years, the Social Sciences Department has convened a conference of regional and national scholars from a broad range of disciplines far beyond the social sciences to lend their voices to a rich and ongoing dialogue on the topics of race and ethnicity, all for the benefit of our students, our colleagues, and the greater community. Their work truly exemplifies the words that our college's president, Steve Ender, uses to describe GRCC. We provide the first two years of a university education with a community college philosophy. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I do need to bestow a special recognition on one faculty member in particular, and that is Mike Light, <laughs> professor of history and department head of social sciences. And he'll also humor me by standing again because we need to know who you are. Without Mike's leadership, this event would not have happened, so thank you, thank you. Now to the main event. Isabel Wilkerson is a Pulitzer Prize winning writer who is currently professor of journalism and director of narrative nonfiction at Boston University. She's also taught at Princeton University and Emory University. Tonight, she will be discussing her first book, the Warmth of Other Suns, the epic story of America's Great Migration, a book that was 15 years in the making and that follows the intimate and moving stories of three African American families who left the only place they'd ever known, the rural and small town South, to find a better life in the urban North and West. It is the first major work to chronicle the Great Migration and its aftermath on a national scale over the course of nearly a century. Toni Morrison has called the book profound, necessary, and a delight to read. Tom Brokaw praises it as an epic for all Americans who want to understand the making of our modern nation. In the New York Times Book Review, it has been acclaimed as a massive and masterly account, immensely readable. In The New Yorker, as a deeply affecting, finely crafted and heroic book, and in The Wall Street Journal, as a brilliant and stirring epic. Isabel Wilkerson was born and raised in Washington, D.C., where her parents settled after journeying from Georgia and Southern Virginia during the Great Migration. She attended Howard University and graduated with a degree in journalism, a passionate and natural-born writer, she served as the editor-in-chief of her college paper, The Hilltop, and landed prestigious internships at both the Los Angeles Times and the Washington Post. Her love of the written word has led her to a prolific and distinguished career in journalism, most of it spent at the New York Times. There, as Chicago bureau chief, she won the 1994 Pulitzer Prize for feature writing for her pieces on the rural heartache of the Midwest floods and her profile of a 10-year-old boy growing up with a man's obligations on the south side of Chicago. She was the first black woman to be awarded a Pulitzer Prize in journalism and the first black American to win for individual reporting. That year, she also won the George Polk Award for regional reporting and was named Journalist of the Year by the National Association of Black Journalists. She was later awarded a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship to complete the research 
for the warmth of other suns. We are fortunate indeed to have Isabel Wilkerson as our guest tonight. Please join me in welcoming her. Um, it is such an honor to be here. In some ways, it's a homecoming because this is the state where I began my professional career. I actually began as a young reporter at the Detro Detroit Free Press. And so Michigan is very dear to my heart. I spent many uh, an hour driving all over the state um, uh, from Port Huron to Traverse City. Uh, to Grand Rapids, of course, and to Saginaw, and uh, to beautiful South Haven, and uh, the entire uh, west coast of Michigan. I am going to uh, do the professorial thing and ask that um, people move forward, because this book is, uh, please do, because this book is a grand epic, as this beautiful space is, but it's also quite intimate. And I'd like to have everyone as close as they possibly can be. And thank you so much for cooperating. <laughs> I'll give you a chance to get seated. Thank you. It's, it's very emotional and special for me to be standing here because I have to think back to the moment that I first arrived in Michigan so many years ago, uh, coming from Washington, D.C. I arrived in January, which coming from Washington, D.C., which can be shut down at the slightest flurry, was, uh, meant that this was quite an adjustment coming to the Midwest for my very first professional job at the Detroit Free Press. It was five degrees, and I had never experienced five degrees before. Um, it snowed that first year, and the snow did not melt until Memorial Day. I had not been accustomed to that. You know that well, don't you? <laughs> and so I've come a long way indeed from uh, the early days as a, as a rookie reporter at the Detroit Free Press. Um, it was the time that I spent in Detroit that helped bring me back to the Midwest, uh, where I, uh, after having gone to the New York Times, I was not at the Detroit Free Press for very long. I went to the New York, to the New York Times, uh, and uh, someone found out that I'd been at the Detroit Free Press and decided that I should come to the Detroit Bureau of the New York Times. For the longest time, a lot of people uh, at the at the Times and, and elsewhere thought I was that thought I was from Detroit, which I took as quite um, an honor because it seemed to me that they felt that I had covered it well enough as if I were from Detroit, from Michigan, and so that, I think that's an honor indeed for someone who had to learn it from scratch, coming from a different part of the country. I um, now, as you know, am in a very different space because I have just spent 15 years working on this book. This is the book. <laughs> it's called The Warmth of Other Suns. And it, is, uh, it was a labor of love. And I will talk tonight about the making of the book, why I decided to do this, what it means, and uh, what it stands for ultimately, what this book is truly about, and how it connects all of us as Americans truly to uh, an aspect of humanity that a lot of us uh, don't think about that much, but literally would not be where we are had people not done what was done in this book. Now, this book took me 15 years, which means that if it were a human being, it would be in high school and dating. <laughs> yes, but um, instead it is a book, and um, it has taken on a life of its own, as do teenagers, and uh, so I'm here to talk with you about how it came to be. 
I want to first say, though, that um, you know, the, the title of it is The Warmth of Other Suns, and I will talk with you about the title. The title has its own story. But the subtitle is The Epic Story of America's Great Migration, which would lead one to believe that it is about the great migration of African Americans from the South to the North. And on some level, on, in many ways, it is about that very thing. But that is not truly what it is underneath it all. Underneath it all, this book is really about fortitude and courage and the decisions that uh, are responsible for the vast majority of Americans being where they happen to be at this very moment. Because someone in almost all of our backgrounds did what the people in this book did in order to get us to where we are. We all owe our very existence to the fact that someone made the heartbreaking, difficult decision to leave the only place that they had ever known for a place that they had never seen in hopes that life might be better. That is the story of America, and that is the story of the people in this book, and it is through their eyes that we get a window into what did it take for people to cross the Atlantic in steerage, to cross the Rio Grande, to cross the Pacific Ocean, not knowing what the future might hold, not knowing if they would ever see their loved ones again from back home, not knowing how well or, or ill they would be received in this new land that they were going to, not knowing how well they would be able to adjust to a forbidding and often alien circumstance in the big, uh, unforgiving cities of the North and the West. That is what propelled uh, many of us to even get to the point where we are right now, because someone in all of our backgrounds did this, so that the people in this book, the people in this book are in some ways proxies for someone in all of our backgrounds, even if we are not part of this particular migration, because human beings do certain things. When they are faced with an untenable circumstance, whether it's famine in Ireland or, or political upheaval in other parts of the world, they will do whatever it takes to find freedom and to find a place where they can raise their children and live out their lives and be their fuller selves, no matter how far that journey may take them. And it is that story that ultimately propels all of us to where we are. It's my belief that we all owe a debt to those people who made that tough decision. And this book is about how they made the decision. It asks the question uh, that essentially is an existential one for all of us of what, where did we come from? Who are we? What did it take for us to get here? And what are we to learn from all that has gone before us? What are we to learn from the people, the ancestors who made this big decision that is the reason why we happen to be where we are? Now, this migration, because it's a human response to difficult, challenging uh, obstacles and oppression, which is also a human reality, is also uh, an opportunity for us to understand how, in other ways, it might be different. The way that this is different is that this is a migration that occurred within the borders of our own country. This migration involved six million African Americans, six million Southerners, who were forced to make the decision of their lives, a heartbreaking decision. And that decision was whether to stay or whether to go. And they were all facing that decision. And that's a decision, of course, that's a, a, one that is usually made by immigrants. But these are the only people within our country who had to make the decision of whether to stay or whether to go and to, in, in some ways, become immigrants within their own country. They're the only group of people who've ever had to do that, to make that decision. And that means that this was a, a, an immigration within the borders of our own country. They were not immigrants. They were citizens of the United States. But where they were born and where they were living, they were not able to live out the true rights and privileges of citizenship. And so they had to go to far-flung places in order to find uh, and experience the rights that they had been born to, but which were not recognized where they were from. And thus, this migration in some ways was, in fact, more a seeking of political asylum within the borders of their own country. It was a defection from a caste system which is almost unimaginable to us now in 2011, almost unimaginable. This migration was so massive that it redistributed an entire population. At the beginning of this great migration, meaning uh, before World War I, 
90% of all African Americans were living in the South, 90%. And that was decades after the Emancipation Proclamation. In other, in other words, decades after African Americans had been putatively freed by the Emancipation Proclamation and would thus have been free to move about anywhere in the country since they were considered citizens. But they did not actually act upon that until World War I. And, they, and th that migration, once it began, did not end until 1970, when the ultimate reasons for that migration came to an end after the Civil Rights era. This migration uh, began because of, th this migration began because of a need that the North had for labor. And I'm gonna get into that a little bit later, but I wanna talk with you a little about the world that they left and why they felt compelled to leave and what we can all learn from that. It's astounding that the things that I'm about to describe to you happened within the borders of our own country, um, happened not that long ago. Many of the people who experienced the things I'm describing and many of the people who put in motion the things that I'm describing are still alive and with us today. So to give a little sense of what life was like for people and why they felt the need to leave this caste system, a caste system is, a, is an artificial hierarchy. It's an artificial hierarchy that is often created for ultimately economic purposes. The purpose in the South was that the South relied upon a, uh, an oversupply of cheap labor, demanded and needed to have an oversupply of cheap labor in order to uh, plant, chop, tend, and harvest the cotton, the tobacco, the sugar, the rice, all of the staples that were the basis of the Southern economy. It relied not on just having cheap labor, but having an oversupply of cheap labor, such that when there needed to be extra hands in the field, when all of this cotton was coming in, uh, becoming, coming into flour, when all the tobacco needed to be harvested and smoked and prepared, they needed to have as many hands as they could. That meant that other times of the year, those people might not be working. And so they needed to have an oversupply ready and willing to work for the cheapest uh, amounts that, that, that the, that the uh, powers that be could get away with. And they had an opportunity to maintain that through obviously slavery, but after slavery through what we know as sharecropping. So there were many means and ways of doing it. But ultimately it came under the overarching reality of a caste system. In order to maintain this oversupply of cheap labor, there had to be some way of keeping them in this place. And keeping them in this fixed place meant having a system, a hierarchy in which there were defined and rigid roles for anyone who was living in that world, black or white. It meant that people who were within that world were in some ways bound by it, imprisoned by it. And even those who appeared to be benefiting from it were in fact as much in prison as those who were being held down by it. So it hurt everybody. Those people who were on the bottom of it were clearly being oppressed, repressed, limited, and restricted in everything that they did. But those who were putatively on top were suffering spiritually, one might argue. Because if you have to expend that much energy in order to keep someone else down, it means that you're not able to flourish yourself in the way that you might otherwise. And this was the caste system which we know as Jim Crow. Now I want to give a couple of examples. The idea is that the way for the caste system to work, everyone needed to know what the rules were. Everyone had to abide by those rules, even if it meant by force. And people were assigned to a place in that caste upon birth. So some of the rules are, one of the rules was that in Birmingham, Alabama, Alabama being one of the states which was the receiving, was, which was one of the sending states, one of the originating states for many African Americans in Michigan. Maybe a good bulk of the African Americans in Michigan are from Alabama and Tennessee in particular. And in, a, in, in um, Birmingham, Alabama, which would have been one of the big cities, big towns there at the time, it was actually against the law for a black person and a white person to merely play checkers together. Someone must have seen a black person and a white person playing chess checkers together in some town square, and they 
might have been having a good time, maybe too good of a time. Maybe they were laughing. Maybe someone, the wrong person had won. Who knows what happened? But someone saw that and decided that the entire foundation of, of Southern civilization was in peril and that they could not have this, this could not continue. And so someone actually wrote that down as a law. So that it was illegal for a black person and a white person to play checkers together, which is just as arbitrary and arcane as saying someone with freckles cannot play with someone who does not have freckles. We cannot have that. That is a violation of Southern culture. That's essentially the kind of thing, the basis upon which the arbitrary nature of the dividing line that was chosen in this caste system. Another thing that was common throughout the South was something that I discovered that was occurring in North Carolina, but actually was, was, popu was common in many courtrooms throughout the, the South. And that was that in courtrooms throughout the South, there was a black Bible and a white Bible to swear to tell the truth on. That meant that if a black person came to the witness stand, there had to be a separate Bible that had to be pulled out for them that they could touch because they could not touch the same Bible as had been touched by the, uh, by the white uh, eyewitness who might have preceded that person. It was rare enough for a black person to be uh, testifying in any case. That was a, a rarity. But when they, when they did testify, there had to be a separate Bible for them. And I found out about this case um, uh, through an article that ran in one of the Raleigh newspapers. And when it appeared in the Raleigh newspaper, it did not appear in such a way as to suggest that this was an arcane, arbitrary, or um, just bizarre ritual. It was described only because it had caused something of a disruption in the courtroom that day. It was it made the paper, not because it was an unusual or bizarre law, but because that particular day, the, a trial that was in session had to be disrupted because they could not find the black Bible. A black witness had come to the stand, and they couldn't find the black Bible. That meant that the bailiff, the sheriff, all had to search the courtroom, search the courthouse in order to find the Bible that this person could, uh, could swear to tell the truth on. Everyone is waiting for them to come back with this Bible. You would think that given that this was a rarity anyway, that the judge might have said, well, one, this one time, we'll let it pass. But he didn't. He said, this is, the, this is the law of the state of North Carolina. And if it's the law of the state of North Carolina, and this is a court of law, we will abide by the law. Find the Black Bible. And so they finally uh, found the Black Bible and could proceed with the, with the trial. But you know, since I've talked about this uh, over the, the months since the book has been out, I've gotten the question of, well, were they different Bibles? Like, was one Bible the King James Version and the other was the American Standard? Was there a difference in the content inside the Bible? Actually, they were the same King James Bible, but, the, but these two, the two races could not touch the same sacred object. They could not touch the same sacred object. Um, and so that's yet another example of the arcane nature of this caste system. I have, uh, you know, I, as I've indicated, been all over the country um, from, uh, from Massachusetts to Hawaii talking about the, this book and the migration and what it means and the overarching effect that it's had on our, our whole country. And as I talk about it, I think I, my toughest uh, audiences are teenagers. Uh, the teenagers, people in high school, who I have to figure out, I've tried to figure out how can I get through to young people the reality of the world that the people were living in. And so I came up with what, I mean, there are many, many examples in the book, and I want to say a couple of things about the examples in the book. There are no references in this entire book, and this book is a, it is a long book. It goes fast, though. I'll let you know, those of you who haven't read it, it goes quite fast because it's about people. It's about these three individuals, but I'll get to them later. 
So throughout this whole book, there are no references to water fountains or restrooms, meaning the segregated, colored only and white only water fountains and restrooms. And that's because we know that already. There's, there's nothing in this book, or I was seeking to present only things in this book that we would not have known already. So all of these examples are things that make it come alive in ways that are real by taking mundane things that we all take for granted now and showing how they played out in a caste system that was an artificial hierarchy that these people had to live under from the moment they woke up until the moment that they went to sleep. There were constant reminders, and restrooms and water fountains were the least of it. I would argue, in fact, after having spent so much time on this book, that if it were just about the water fountains and the restrooms, they wouldn't have left. That was minor. That was nothing compared to what they actually had to go through day in and day out. A nerve jangling existence of always trying to negotiate what was appropriate and what was not. Where was the line of demarcation for people in a caste system? And so one of the examples that I have uh, um, tried uh, to uh, use or to, to represent for uh, high school students is this. Um, but before I tell you what it is, I want to first get a show of hands. How many of you have, within the last week, let's say, passed someone on the road? OK. That, really, now you know you all have passed someone over on the road. I, whenever I ask this question, um, people always sort of tentatively raise their hand. They look around and see if other people are doing it, and they, then they tentatively raise their hand. And I find that kind of interesting that people do. It's almost as if people think, is there a new law that I don't know about? I'm not supposed to do this. <laughs> and I can assure you that there is no new law. It's perfectly legal, as far as I know, in most states still. But uh, during this Jim Crow system, which of course began in 1896 with Plessy versus Ferguson and did not end until after the Civil Rights Acts of 1964, did not end until the, after the, of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, did not end until the 1970s. During this period of time, throughout much of the South, it was actually against the law, against custom or protocol for an African-American motorist to merely pass a white motorist on the street, no matter how slowly they were going. No matter how slowly they were going. No matter how, you know, you're behind someone and you know they're lost. You could just feel it. They keep stopping and halting every, you know, five feet, thinking this is the turn. No, this is the turn. And it did not matter how slowly this person was going. That African American motorist did not dare, could not. It was against the law for them to pass that white motorist no matter how slowly they were going. Now that really gets to the, to the high school students because they're just beginning to drive and they want to go as fast as they can. And that really gets to them. I have heard murmuring in the back whenever I mention that. They just cannot believe that. That is the one thing that they could not have lived under, they, that they would say. One of them said when I first mentioned it, and this was, this was in Hawaii, this was not you know, on the mainland. These are not people who had any direct connection to the Great Migration, one could say, but this is a universal human experience. And this, they, they said, well, I would have I honked. <laughs> and I say, when they say I would have honked, I say, well, let me start again and explain this to you. If you could not pass a person on the road, you most certainly could not honk. Someone else said, well, I would have tailgated just to give them a message. And I'd say, if you cannot pass them on the street, you most certainly could not tailgate either. And they cannot wrap their minds around that. And in a way, that's a, a really wonderful and beautiful thing. That means that we have come so far in so short a period of time that young people of today cannot fathom this entire set of protocols that people not that long ago, people who are still alive and walking the earth today, had to live under as a daily part of their existence, day in and day out, hour in and hour out. And that, meant, that means that we have come a long way indeed from the time when this was a reality for so many people in a major region of our country. And so they find that Th this, ex this experience is, is uh, mind-boggling to them. Now, whenever I tell this, of course, there's a little, um, you know, there's a little laughter in the audience as people think about, you know, the absurdity of trying to, of thinking about honking when very clearly you know you couldn't honk if you couldn't pass someone on the street. But it's, it was, it, it's easier for us now to, to see the absurdity, but at the time, 
We're talking life and death. We're literally talking life and death. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, for one thing, every four days during this period of time, the year, the decades leading up to the Great Migration, uh, meaning the, the decades when Jim Crow was coming into existence throughout the South, and the, the decades following the beginning of this exodus of African Americans from the South to the North and the West, every four days an African American was lynched. And not lynched always for the, the reasons that have gotten all the headlines most of the time when you go looking through the record. They were, you know, they, it was not always because of an, M, of an Emmett Till accusation. In other words, it was not always because uh, of an African American male having been accused of some untoward behavior toward a white woman in the South. The more common reasons for, for lynching had to do with the more mundane things, which is what I've just described to you. One person was lynched, I mean, in, in this a book about lynching, there are many, many books about lynching, but there was a case of someone who was lynched for having been accused of, of stealing 75 cents. There was someone else uh, lynched for having been accused of having stolen a mule. And the, one of the more common reasons for lynching was for someone who has been accused of acting like a white person. That alone, and that's a very large umbrella, that could mean not stepping off the sidewalk fast enough, not tipping one's hat quickly enough, not taking one's hat off in the presence of a, of a person who demanded that that be done. All of these things, looking someone straight in the eye, not remembering to say yes ma'am or yes, yes uh, sir. All of these small customs that had to be memorized by any child by the time they were five or six years old if they were to survive in the caste system of the South, which ruled for almost 80 years, four generations within the lifespan of many, many Americans alive today. That's how real this was. And to give you an example of, uh, of how driving was a perilous thing and was, in fact, a life or death thing, there was a case that ran in the New York Times. It was in the 1940s. And it was of a man, an African-American man, who was out in the country in Mississippi. And he was driving um, a mule. In other words, he was on a wagon with a mule. And he was on one of those dusty country roads that was very narrow, hard for anyone to pass if you, if you, if you were on that road. And behind him, uh, he found were uh, driving up, uh, racing really toward him was a, a car filled with several, uh, several white motorists. And they were in a hurry, apparently, uh, quite a hurry. And they were uh, pressing him to move out of the way, but he could not get his mule out of the way fast enough for them. And they were in a tremendous hurry. But they were not in so much of a hurry, or they, let, let, me, let me rephrase it, they apparently had enough time or decided to take the time to stop the car, get to the driver of the mule, beat him to death, move the thing out of the way, and then move on to their destination. And that appeared in the New York Times. This is not hearsay or oral tradition. This is something that m many of the sources for this book were from um, newspapers of the day, leading newspapers of the day, both in the North and the South. And that gives you a sense of just how very real the fear, how very real the danger and terror it would have been for people growing up in that era. You could truly lose your life over something as simple as passing someone on the street or not moving far fast enough at whatever it is that you were expected to do. So this was the world of the vast majority of African Americans uh, during the 20th century because the vast majority of African Americans were living in the South. Now, these, these uh, people were in some ways imprisoned in this caste system until something very big happened in Europe. And that shows you the effect of world events on the smallest person in this country even. And that was that Europe was at war. Europe went at war. That meant, that meant uh, an all but complete halt to immigration from Europe. And it was the immigrants from Europe during the early part of the 20th century that were fueling and uh, keeping the foundries, the factories, the steel mills, and the railroads of the North uh, going. And when the, that immigration came to a virtual halt, and when Europeans who were here, European immigrants who were here in this country, had to be called back 
to serve or to help in their home countries in Europe during this war, that meant that the foundries, the factories, the steel mills, and the railroads of the North had a problem. They had a big problem. That meant they had no one to work their uh, factories at a time when there was more need for workers than ever before. And so what did they do? They began casting about for the cheapest labor in the land. And the cheapest labor in the land were African Americans in the South, many of whom were not being paid at all for their labor. They were working for the right to live on the land that they were farming. They were sharecroppers, who many of them, uh, anthropologists who were doing work in that day, found that the majority of them were not earning a cent for their hard labor during the year. And so the North, why are, why are there a large percentage of African Americans in the North and the West? Why is it that even to this day, even though we now see through the census over the last few decades a cessation of the Great Migration, Great Migration ended in 1970, um, and, and since that time, the migration, the population growth has been favoring the South since the migration ended because the essential reasons came to an end that made it necessary for people to leave. Why is it that the majority of African Americans that you meet in the North and the West, in any city in the North or the West, the majority of those people are descended from this great migration, the majority? Why is it that, the, that still to this day, even though the South is the ancestral homeland of almost every African American in the United States, that the North and the West still command nearly half of all black people in the country? And that is because these people made the decision, the tough decision, to leave, this, uh, leave that part of the country at the invitation of the North. A lot of people forget that. They didn't just show up. They were invited to the North, desperate for workers. They began, the North began to send recruiters uh, to the small villages and uh, farm towns of the South. And they found specific places that they, that they thought amenable. They did not go in large numbers. Why didn't they go in large numbers to recruit African Americans to the North? They didn't because the South did not want to see the North poaching its cheap labor and did everything it could to keep people from leaving. One of the things that they did was that they began to work on both the supply side and the demand side. On the supply side, meaning the workers, the African Americans who had been making up the bulk of the work uh, done, that was done in the South, they began to make it all but impossible for them to leave if they wanted to. They would arrest them from the railroad platforms if there were large numbers of African Americans with tickets heading north. They would, they would arrest them from the train seats. So here you are, you're in the seat, you've saved up what little bit you had in order to get this ticket, you're in the seat, the train is about to take off, the conduct, conductor comes toward you, you think you're handing them the ticket. This may be the first time you've even, even been on a train. And instead of the t conductor taking the ticket, the conductor arrests you. And the charge could be any number of things. One of them was, a co was commonly vagrancy, meaning not working at that time. It was actually in many counties they passed laws that it was against the law for an African American to be not working. And uh, they would be arrested, and the only way they could get out is to pay some fine of 50 or $60, which they wouldn't have had. And uh, this is how peonage laws came into effect. Peonage meaning that people could be arrested for not working for on any uh, charge that was deemed uh, uh, acceptable to the people in the, the powers that be, and that, and that anyone who could afford to pay their, the, fee, the fine that they were facing could then hire them out uh, for free, essentially, for them to work off the, the fee that had been paid for them to be in, uh, in jail. So all of this, this was a circular, trumped up uh, r reminder of the limits and restrictions on people at that time. So, the, so that the powers that be in the South would arrest people on the railroad platforms, would arrest people in their train seats, and when there were too many people to arrest, they would wave the train on through so that people who had been saving up for months and months and months for this chance to get to freedom had to watch that freedom train pass them by. They had to find all kinds of other ingenious ways to try to figure out how to get out. Some people would, would plot and strategize and not tell a soul, maybe tell one or two trusted people, and then they would get out. They had to sneak out in the middle of the night. They had to go to other uh, 
train stations where they thought perhaps there would not be so many African Americans there that they might be able to get out without notice. There were all kinds of things that they had to do in order to figure out ways to, uh, to get free. I want to read to you an, uh, a passage from the Macon Telegraph to give you a sense of the sense of alarm and panic that was, that was gripping the South at the time that these people were beginning to leave. And this is what the editorial says. It says, everybody seems to be asleep about what is going on right under our noses. That is, everybody but those farmers who have wakened up on mornings recently to find every Negro over 21 on his place gone, to Cleveland, to Pittsburgh, to Chicago, to Indianapolis. And while our very solvency, again, this is the words of the Macon Telegraph, while our very solvency is being sucked out beneath us, we go on about our affairs as usual. So this is in a sense of a, the alarm and hand-wringing and debate that was going on in the South as these people were being uh, recruited and drawn to and invited to the North and away from a place that they would have always wanted to leave because of the strictures on them, but had no opportunity, no, op no way of making sure that they could actually get out and find a place for themselves to work until the North came calling. And that is when uh, the opportunities began to arise for them. Now, the South did not forget the demand side. And on the demand side, the South began to put in place uh, mechanisms to make it less hospitable, let's say, for Northerners to come recruiting uh, to the South. And what they did was they set out um, all kinds of licensing fees that were necessary for anyone in the North to want to come recruiting a single black person. So one of them, Macon, where I just read to you, set out a law, they created a law in which they said any northerner who wants to recruit a single black person to work for them, meaning taking them out of the South, would have to pay a fine of $25,000, $25,000 to recruit a single black person in 1919, 1920. Um, who would pay that now for you know an entire office, I mean, really, you know, $25,000. But in, in 1919, 1920, that was the equivalent of $500,000, half a million dollars to recruit a single black person. Clearly, that was going to put a damper, or one would think, on the effort by the North to continue recruiting people from the South, African Americans from the South. And yet, that didn't stop them. What they ended up doing was that they would go incognito and they would go into gatherings of, of African Americans at church or as they were at these various Sunday picnics that they would have for themselves. And they would go move through the crowd and they would say, does anybody want to go to Chicago? Anybody want to go to Detroit? Come and see me. They would whisper it through the crowd so as not to attract attention. And then there would be large numbers of people who would answer that call. And that is how a good number of African Americans got here to the north. Now, I spend a lot of time, in, you know, obviously talking about the sense of panic, the sense of peril, and the sense of, of, of restrictions on the people as they try to make this decision to leave. But um, this book is essentially about three people, three people who represent the six million who ultimately ended up having to leave. And these three people each represent the three major streams of this migration out of the South to all points north and west. This migration was not just a haphazard unfurling of lost souls. It was actually an orderly uh, and fairly systematic uh, ex evacuation, you might say, from the South, from this one region of the country. There were three major streams. One stream is the one that took people from Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, and Virginia to Washington, D.C., which would have been the first stop, and then on to Philadelphia, and then on forward to, to Newark and New York and to Boston. That was one stream, and there's an individual who represents that stream. He was, uh, the name of, his name was George Swanson Starling, and he'd been a fruit picker in Florida. He had gone to college. He'd had two years of college, and he was quite good with numbers. He'd been the valedictorian of his high school, small though it had been, in Eustis, Florida. 
And uh, when he got out of school, he went. He 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 was forced to leave school because the money had run out, and there was no there were no um, schools that permitted, no colleges that permitted African Americans to go to college in the region of the of Florida that he was from. And so when he got back, when when the money ran out, he was forced to return to the work of the people of the region that he was from, which was fruit picking, citrus picking. But when he got there. He found that because he'd had some education and he was good with numbers, he could see that they were being woefully underpaid, cheated really, and that the work was dangerous. They had to splice together um, two and three sets of ladders in order to climb into 40-foot trees. That's four-story high seedling orange trees in order to pick the oranges from these trees that were going to come up north to New York and Philadelphia and Boston and Chicago and all the places that wanted them outside of, the, outside of Florida. Not only that, the work was dangerous because people would fall out of the trees and break a limb. So the work was dangerous and the pay was, as, was just as bad. And so he began to try to negotiate for higher wages. They were trying to get a nickel more a box to go from, say, uh, 14, 15 cents to maybe 19 cents a box. Boxes that were going to go out on the open market for three or four dollars. They were not trying to get the three or four dollars. They just wanted a nickel more a box. But for doing that, um, they uh, were the South, the Fl Florida in particular, was not a place where that was acceptable in that era. And so he ended up having to flee for his life for having had the um, the audacity to try to negotiate with people over the rights for better work conditions for people at that era. And he fled to Harlem in 1945. The second, the second uh, stream was the Midwest stream, which involves Michigan. This is a stream that brought people from, from Mississippi and Arkansas and Alabama and Tennessee uh, to Chicago, to Detroit, to Grand Rapids, uh, to Cleveland and Pittsburgh and the entire Midwest. That was the stream. And this stream is represented by a woman who had been a sharecropper's wife in Mississippi. She, uh, I, I was drawn to her for many reasons, but one reason I was drawn to her was one of the first things she said was, she said, you know, I, I used to have to pick cotton, and I was just terrible at it. I just was terrible at it, she said. And I never had thought about people being good or bad at it. It was just something that you did, you, you see people doing it, and you just see, assume that there's, it's just something that you do. And you would never think about what does it take to be good or bad? What does it mean to be good or bad at it? Well, it turned out that there were actually uh, quotas that they were expected to pick in a certain, they were supposed to pick 100 pounds of cotton a day. She could never get to 100. Uh, she said she would just pick and she would cry, and she would pick and she would cry. So it was a very difficult thing for her to do. Uh, she felt bad about herself because there was a hierarchy there. There were people who could pick, pick 400 pounds, and here she was barely able to pick 100. So she was terrible at picking cotton, and I, I thought that was kind of fascinating in and of itself. But that's not the reason that she left. She ended up leaving because uh, a cousin of her husband's had been beaten to within an inch of his life over a theft that he had not committed. He had been, what he had been accused of stealing turned up the next day, but there were no apologies in order because sometimes you just got the wrong person or sometimes the person hadn't really done the thing that had been accused of. Um, but that was just the way that it was and those things kind of happened and you just, that was just the way that it was. But her husband did not take to it well. And when he saw what had happened to his cousin, he went home to his wife, Ida May, and he said, this is the last crop we're making. This is the last crop we're making. And so they set out on a journey uh, uh, for the North. They first had to divest of what little they had. They could not tell anyone except her mother and one of his trusted, uh, cousin, uh, trusted nephews, and they they began to plot their way off of the planter's land and ultimately ended up uh, in Chicago went via, via Milwaukee in the exact migration route that would have been expected for someone from that part of the country. In other words, the migration was quite orderly so that even now to this day, even to this day, if you're in a particular part of the North or the West, you can almost tell where that African American family is ultimately from, where their roots are from, or where, as the people describe themselves, where their people are from, based on the city in the north or their west where they happen to be. So if they happen to be in, in Philadelphia, you can pretty much be sure that you're going to run into a lot of people who are from the Carolinas. That's just the way that it is. And so the, these were very orderly. It's sort of like if you go to Minnesota, you run into a lot of people from Scandinavia 
same idea. Uh, and so then the final stream is a stream from Louisiana and Texas to Los Angeles, Oakland, and the entire West Coast. And that is represented by a doctor, um, a Dr. Robert Joseph Pershing Foster, who was a uh, surgeon in the Army, but who found that when he got out of the Army, he could not practice surgery in his own hometown. And so what he ended up doing was he ended up deciding, I've, I'm going to go, I'm going to set out for, an, for a journey far, far away, I'm going to California. And he decided he had a small family, he decided he would go out on his own first, scope it out and see what it was like and get situated and then send for his family. But what he had not calculated, he had not realized that it was uh, going to be a perilous journey. He had not understood, and many people had not understood, what the boundaries were of this migration, of the uh, caste system that had bound him in the South. And it turned out that he was having to drive almost 2,000 miles to get from where he was from to the West Coast. He was driving in a Buick Roadmaster, and he said it rode like a chariot. He said that if you had seen it, you would have wanted it too. You would have wanted it too. And so he set out on this uh, Buick, Buick Roadmaster through the desert and through the mountains. And that part of the country looks very different from this part of the country. The roads, the, the, the land is rugged and, and, and unforgiving, mean and craggy. And it, you're going through mountains, you're going through deserts, you're going through great expanses of space in which the settlements are maybe 100 miles apart. You are in what feels like in the middle of nowhere. You are in what feels like a different planet. And I attempted to recreate that journey myself. I actually had my parents with me. Uh, they were retired, and they had lived through the Great Migration. I haven't indicated, haven't said that I'm actually a child of this Great Migration. My mother migrated from Rome, Georgia, and my father from Southern Virginia. And they met in Washington, D.C., and uh, married and had me. And so when it came time for me to take this journey, I really thought it would be useful and, and wonderful to have them with me, and I did. Now, we, what I was trying to do was recreate to the letter what he had experienced when he was driving through the desert. He had given me a, you know, exquisite detail because he said this thing I have been over 3,000 times as to what happened to me and why this happened and what could have happened that would, I could have done that might have made it different and I realized that there was nothing that I could have done to make it different. He had an extremely difficult time. It turned out that he had to drive for three states of the West and these states in the West are like countries unto themselves, huge expanses. And he ended up having to drive all this way by himself and uh, on his own without stopping, without being able to stop. And a lot of uh, people that I've talked to since then or in the course of working on this book said that, you know, the, the wonder of it isn't, isn't that he made it through the desert, through all the turns and all the things that happened to him, but the wonder is he made it at all because he was such a terrible driver, people would say. But nonetheless, I tried to recreate the journey. And we got to the part where uh, following, following it to the letter, we stopped where he was able to stop, and we were to drive through where he could not stop. And I told my parents at the very beginning of it that um, they, my, my father, I told them, you cannot drive. I have to do all the driving because he had done all the driving himself and I have to re recreate it to the letter. I wanted to know what it felt like to be gripping the wheel for so long that your fingers begin to ache. I wanted to know what it was like, or almost lock in place. I wanted to know what it was like to, to drive for so long that your eyes almost want to slam shut on their own and do and that your eyes begin to ache from the lack of sleep. I wanted to know what it was like, and then still there's more road, and the road begins, do you have hairpin turns? So there I was driving, my parents were in the car. It was night, because when he had been turned away, it was at night, I clearly was trying to find a, a hotel room, a motel room, and was stuck not being able to find one, so of course it was nighttime when he was having to face the worst part of the journey, the longest, hardest, craggiest, meanest part of the journey was before him with no sleep and also with the dispiriting reality that he perhaps that this place he was coming to was not as welcoming and open as he had thought it was, but there was no turning back. And so here I was trying to recreate it. And I, the, the road turns mean. The road, there, there are hairpin curves. You're going south and north as much as you are west. Sometimes it seems you're going east <laughs> to get west. And, you're, and still the road is there. There are no other cars on the road because at this time of night, why would anyone be on the roads? So there it's us. I begin to fall asleep at the wheel and veer off the road. And my parents are saying, we need to stop the car. We know that he couldn't stop. We understand that. We understand that you need to, to do this. But 
you know, we, we need to stop the car. We've lived through this. We've been through this already. We've been there, done this. Let's stop the car. And if you won't stop the car, let us out. <laughs> and so we ended up making it as far as Yuma, Arizona, where I decided that for uh, everyone's sake and for peace's sake, I would, I would stop the car. And we had no trouble at all finding. We had a choice of whatever uh, roadside hotels you can imagine uh, were all there. All the major marquee names of the road were all there. And we had no trouble. We could take our pick, which is what he could not do, which also is a reminder of how very far we have come in a relatively short period of time. When he went made this trip, it was 1953. And there are a lot of people who were alive in 1953 who are fit, well, great memories, running things right now who were alive in 1953 to be able to know and remember that was not a long time ago. That was an eye blink. And that's how different the, the, the world has come since then. Um, I, want to, I want to end before, I want to make sure I mention two things before closing and taking your questions, because there's so much that I could say about this, this migration or any migration. The, 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 the essential message of any migration is that it takes a tremendous amount of vision, determination, will, and courage for anyone to leave the only place that they've ever known for a place that they've never seen. And when they do that, they tend to be, you know, traditionally immigrants tend to be people who have already gotten to a certain point in their lives where whatever limitations, restrictions, or disadvantages they may have had where they were coming from, they have already endured that, suffered that. It's hard to make up for um, the lack of food that you didn't, or, or, or good nutrition that you didn't get when you were five, six, seven years old when you're already 25 or 30. It's hard to make up for the nights of going to bed hungry. It's hard to make up for the fact that you could only go to the eighth grade in the county that you happen to be in, whether you were in Italy or, or uh, in China or in Mississippi. It's hard to make up for that when you're already 30 years old. It's hard to make up for the, the sense of loss that comes from that. But when you migrate, it's not too late for the children. There is hope for the next generation. So when people migrate, they often are doing it not for themselves, but for the children and the unseen grandchildren and great-grandchildren that will come after that. Maybe life will be better. And that's the reason why the sacrifice that they make has such, has, has such a massive impact on succeeding generations. And I want to give you a couple of examples of, of the impact of this migration, this particular migration on the United States. Much of American culture as we know it would not exist had there been no great migration. Because this migration was in some ways not just a transfer of people. It was a transfer of culture. The people brought with them their King James Bibles and their 12-string guitars. And in their, in their minds, in their memories, the lyrics of spi the spirituals and the blues and the rhythms of the music that they had played back home. They carried with them the recipes for the cornbread and the, and the um, and the turnip greens that they would ultimately make, and the sweet potato pie, and all the things that they would carry with them. All of those things were with them as they migrated uh, on those buses and on those trains. And they got to the north, and their children had the, the opportunity to go to schools that they would never have had the opportunity to go to. They had the opportunity to be exposed to things that they never would have been able to expose to. They had the opportunity for the first time in American history did a large number of African Americans actually get the opportunity to live out their God-given uh, gifts, whatever they may be, whether it was singing, whether it was, it was, um, whether it was music, whether it was uh, literature, whether it was sports, whatever it might be, this was the first time in American history that these people had the opportunity to live out their, uh, op the opportunities that uh, were and for, to making the most of their gifts that were within them all along. So some of the people who were part of this migration were beneficiaries of this migration, for example, Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison, her parents migrated from Alabama to Lorain, Ohio, where she had the opportunity to do something that we all can take for granted now, and maybe a lot of people don't use as much as they should, but were something that could not have been done uh, had she been growing up in Alabama at the time uh, that, she, that she, if she, had she been in Alabama at the time she was growing up. And that is to simply walk into a library and take out a library book. That would not have been possible for her growing up in Alabama at the time that she would have been uh, a little girl. 
But her parents, by making that leap, gave her the opportunity to be able to get, op to get access to books. And if you're going to become a Nobel laureate, you kind of need to be able to get access to a book now and then. It helps if you're going to become a writer. August Wilson, the playwright, every single one of his plays, he wrote a cycle of 10 plays, from Fences to Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, all of those plays, his entire cycle of plays, uh, two of which he won a Pulitzer Prize for, every single one of them is about the Great Migration, every one. One of the best known plays of the 20th century, uh, Raisin in the Sun, was about the Great Migration. It was about people who were in Chicago having come up in the Great Migration and now find, finding themselves in a, at a point of, of great decision making. Should they stay in the city or should they go to the suburbs? How universal is that? That's a question that many African Americans are facing now, which is one reason why Detroit has a population that it has now from the space on the census. People are making the decision about what they should do about cities that began to fall apart around them. Uh, in the years following the Great Migration. Now, uh, the raisin, A Raisin in the Sun, Lorraine Hansberry, also a product of this Great Migration. When it, comes to, uh, when it comes to music, the American ear, and thus I would argue the human ear because of the impact of American music on the entire world, is uh, shaped by the, the music that grew out of the Great Migration. That sounds like an overstatement, doesn't it? But when you think about it, it all traces back to the humble music that came out of the Great Migration that the people carried with them, the blues, which became rhythm and blues and which became rock and roll. Motown would simply not have existed had there been no Great Migration. Would not, we would not know the names of anybody, all the famous people who came out of that, we wouldn't even know their names. Barry Gordy, for example, he, the founder of Motown, his parents were from Georgia. They migrated to Detroit. It was there when, when he became a grown man, he decided he wanted to go into music, but he was not uh, a singer nor a musician. He wanted to go into the management of music, and he decided he wanted to uh, recruit uh, talent for this budding recording label that he wanted to create. But he didn't have the money to go traveling and scouting all over the country, so what did he do? He looked around the neighborhood in Detroit where he was. And there were all these teenagers. And these teenagers were the children of people who had migrated from the South. They were the children of the Great Migration, all of them. And he saw, for example, these three girls, three young women, teenagers. One of them did not have the greatest voice of the three, but she was full of personality. She had two friends, Mary Wilson and Florence Ballard. Of course, I'm talking about Diana Ross and the Supremes. Diana Ross, we would not know her name had there been no Great Migration. We would not know her name. And the reason we would not know her name is not because she would not have had talent to go off and do great things. She wouldn't have existed because her mother came from Alabama, born in Alabama, father from West Virginia, both leave their home states in the South to come to Detroit as part of the Great Migration, meet in Detroit. How typically, classically, universally American is that? Because how many of us know of or actually are people who descended from a great-grandmother who came from Ireland and who met a great-grandfather from Ireland, from, from, from Poland or from, from Germany or from Italy or from any, some other part of, of Europe or even part of the world, meet in, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan or in South Boston or meet on, in, on the Southwest Side of Chicago or somewhere in, in East Side of Detroit and create whole new lineages. That is the American story. And thus, a lot of us wouldn't even exist had there not been people who did this amazing thing, this courageous act of leaving the only place that they'd ever known for a place that they'd never seen in hopes that life might be better with no guarantees of success. And so Diana Ross is a name that we would not know, not because she's not talented, but because she would not have existed, as I wouldn't have existed either. In a good, How many people in the room would not have existed had there not been someone who came from far away and met uh, an ancestor who came from far away met in this country or somewhere here. That's a good, I mean, about half of the room would disappear. 
because you wouldn't have existed. And that's one of the beauties of, of America, actually. And so sh this is an example of that. Barry Gordy also heard about this very large family in Gary, Indiana, very large family. There were nine or 10 children. He actually uh, summoned them and actually auditioned them. They were apparently making a big splash in Gary in the small, um, you know, the, the talent shows in the you know, high school gymnasiums of Gary. And he heard about them and he auditioned them and he decided that they were, uh, they were talented and he wanted to, to sign them up for his recording label. The, the, there were mainly five boys who were the main ones and it was the youngest one who was the big, who was the, the front man for the group. He was eight. We, you know who I'm talking about, I'm talking about the Jackson Five uh, and Michael Jackson. We would not know their names. We would not know their names because they would not have existed. Their mother came from Alabama, father came from Arkansas, met outside of Chicago, married and had the children, and we would not know their names had there been no Great Migration. The Great Migration is directly responsible for many of the big names that we take for granted in American culture out of the 20th century, from Prince to, uh, to uh, uh, P. Diddy, or whatever his current name is, <laughs> to uh, the great figures of jazz, such as Miles Davis. Miles Davis' parents migrated from Arkansas to Illinois, uh, where he had the luxury of being able to uh, uh, hone and build on his, on his, on his, the, the genius that was within him, which he would never have been able to do in the cotton country of Arkansas. Even though his family was fairly well situated, there would not have been the same opportunities for him to study music as he did when he got out of, when his parents migrated to Ar from Arkansas to Illinois. Thelonious Monk, his parents migrated from, uh, from North Carolina to Harlem when he was five years old, and he too got the opportunity to be able to hone and build and, and explore and develop his genius for, uh, for music. And these are people who are, are pillars of jazz, creators of an entire new genre that we take for granted, but which would not have existed had there been no great migration. And John Coltrane, John Coltrane migrated from North Carolina to Philadelphia at the age of 17, where believe it or not, that is where in Philadelphia, as a result of this great migration, as a result of his participation in the great migration, he got his first alto sax. He got his first alto sax upon, being a, upon participating in the great migration. And you wonder, where would we be? Where would music be? Where would jazz be? Where would culture be? all American culture, but not just American culture, world culture, if he had not gotten a hold of an alto sax, if he had not been part of this great migration. It's, it's unfathomable when you start to think about these huge names, these pillars of American culture, who would simply not even have, ex either not have existed or certainly wouldn't have had the opportunity to live out their God-given talent had there been no opportunity for them as a result of their ability to finally be in a place where they could grow and develop their talent. And when you think about it, it's sobering to contemplate that because this was the first time in American history that large numbers of African Americans had the opportunity to be able to develop their talent, who knows that whether John Coltrane might have been the dud of the family. He might have been the dud. I mean, he might have been the one who was just, who, who was barely scraping by with his talent because who knows what had been in the family up until that moment, because this was the first time that, they had the, that African Americans had the opportunity to develop whatever talent was within them. And that's a massive thing. This was a gift to not just culture, and not just to the United States, but to the world. The names that I have just given to you, and there are many, 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 many other names from from Denzel Washington to Michelle Obama to James Baldwin to Ralph Ellison, all of these people uh, were descendants or participants of the Great Migration. Louis, Louis Armstrong, all of these people were descendants or participants of the Great Migration. And these are people who are not just uh, revered here in the United States. They are re as revered in, in Paris and Milan and in Beijing as they are here. These are gifts to the world gifts that came out of, as a result of the sacrifice that their parents made for them to live 
in a better situation and be able to develop the talents that were within them. And finally, I want to leave you with these things, these two things. One is that from a political standpoint, the Great Migration changed, cult, changed the, the political landscape of the United States, of the, of the North in particular, because these people, when they arrived, became contributors to what we now know as blue states. When they arrived in these big cities, the Democratic Party recognized the option, and they took it. They took it. And they signed these people on quickly. Many of these people had never voted in their lives, have never been able to vote. It was against the law for them to vote. And so when they got to Chicago, got to Detroit, got to Cleveland, got to uh, New York, got to all these places, they became what they became contributors to what we now consider solidly blue states, now purple states maybe, depending upon the, you know, the way uh, things are going. But in any case, they became, uh, they became actually central to several uh, key uh, elections. The most central one probably was the 1940 election of, of Franklin Roosevelt, who was going up for an unprecedented third term against Wendell Wilkie and was under a great deal of pressure and scrutiny as a result of that. So much so that it was questionable as to whether he would win. Franklin Roosevelt and the Democrats needed desperately the swing state of that year. And the swing state of that year was not Ohio or Florida as it is now. There's always a swing state. Believe it or not, the swing state that year was Illinois. And so the Democrats had their national convention in Chicago. It just so happened that Chicago had an advantage that was going to serve FDR well, whether he made use of it later or not, whether he made good on the results of this, of this, of this uh, good turn of events for him. It just so happened that by 1940, hundreds of thousands of new voters who had never been counted before had arrived in the city. And they had arrived from the South. They'd arrived from Mississippi and Arkansas primarily. They had never voted before. The Democrats got to them. One of them was Ida Mae Gladney, the other person in this book. And uh, Franklin Roosevelt needed every vote he could get. He needed that swing state because it's all about electoral votes, as we know. He barely won Illinois. He won by less than 2%. And that 2% margin was made up by those new voters, those African Americans who were part of that great migration. That shows you the, the power and the influence of this migration on one single election. One single election, and uh, Chicago has been a Democratic stronghold ever since, partly as a result of the arrival of these people from the great migration. These people, by their presence in the North, helped put pressure on the South and the North, but primarily the South to ultimately change. They put pressure on the South in these ways. First of all, in any, any part of the world that gets attention in the United States, and meaning primarily the media, they get attention because there's a critical mass of people from that part of the, of the world here in the United States who will, by their presence, put pressure on the media to cover something that otherwise might not have been covered. There's a great deal of coverage of Northern Ireland, for example, um, in previous decades, because there's a large Irish American population here with a vested interest in what's going on in Ireland. And the same goes for other parts of the world. Well, when the North finally had a large percentage of African Americans here, that meant that that put more focus on the South, where there had been resistance all along. But suddenly, because there was a large number of African Americans in the North, not necessarily agitating for, for change, although many of them were, but by their very presence, it made the North more aware. They had to be aware of what was going on in the South because more agitation in the South meant more arrivals of African Americans to the North. And the North was ambivalent, quite frankly ambivalent about having a large number of, of African Americans here. So they took greater interest in what was going on in the South during the 50s and the 60s, precisely at the time when the civil rights movement began to take hold. It could take hold because even though there had been resistance all along, there had always been resistance, always, to both slavery and to Jim Crow. But the, the, the people were so outnumbered and their deaths went unnoticed. They went, I should say, if they might have been noticed by the coverage of the lynchings, but they went unresponded to by the powers that be. Suddenly, because of the large number of African Americans in the North, several things happened. There was going to be more coverage. 
Secondly, there was going to be an, a safety valve for those people who stayed in the South and needed to fight that final battle for what we consider freedom and, and, and change in the South. They all, by that time, those people who uh, braved the, uh, the, the sheriff's dogs and hoses, each one of those people had a great aunt or a cousin or somebody up in the North who, if things got difficult, they had a place to go. Finally, for the first time, that had never happened in American history. Secondly, those people who were up in the North were sending money back to help support the people that their loved ones who were still there in the same way that immigrants have done all along and do to this day. There's the expectation and there's the, uh, the sense of obligation, uh, uh, willing obligation to help those people who are still back at home. And that's what they were doing. The people who were in the North were doing that. They were making more money than the people in the South and they were sending money back home. And then finally, they were the ones who were here in the North and would go back to the South and regale the people with all the stories of the freedoms that they could do, that they no longer had to step off the sidewalk, that they could actually talk to a white person face to face and even shake their hand, which was not, a, which was not permitted in the South. That they could actually call a white person by their first name and didn't have to say yes ma'am and no, no ma'am. This did not mean that life was perfect by any means. Many, there were many examples of the many, many restrictions on people in the North uh, who had come up in the South, restrictive covenants, bombings whenever people tried to move outside of the neighborhoods in a neighborhood where they were not considered welcome, uh, they were not permitted to go into unions, all kinds of things would happen to them. But there were basic freedoms that they could have just upon crossing into the border of Michigan, crossing into the border of Ohio, crossing into the border of Illinois. And those, that reality, that sense of there is another way to live seeped into the people who stayed in the South. And they said to themselves, why can't we have that here in our own ancestral homeland? And so all of these things, North and South working together as a result of this great migration, helped to f fuel this, uh, this movement toward the ultimate freedoms, which occurred as a result of the civil rights era and changed the country North and South ultimately. But I want to leave you with this. And that is that this migration and any migration, the things, the people who made the decisions in all of our backgrounds that are re the result of why we are here today, all of us on some level are here today because someone made a decision. If we ourselves are not the ones who are the immigrants who made the decision to leave, had to have a moment of some kind of heartbreak and heartache of that moment of truth upon leaving. This is about, in some ways, the, the tough decision, maybe the most difficult decision a person will ever make, which is to leave uh, all that they know. There's a moment of truth for everyone who makes such a decision. There is a moment of truth that everyone in all of our backgrounds had to have made in order for us to be here right now. And that is the moment when a young person, because this migration is generally a young person's game, that young person had to look into the eye of the person who had raised them, their mother, their father, their grandmother, whomever it might have been, their grandfather, great uncle, whomever it might have been, look into the per that person's eye and to know that they might never see them again alive. And that person who had raised this young person who had decided that th it was the time to go, that they could not stay any longer, had to look into the eye of the person that they had raised from, um, from an infant, from a baby, from before they knew they were even who they were and wonder if they would ever see that person alive again before they crossed the ocean or crossed the mountains or crossed the Ohio River and beyond in order to get to the north. And that young person had to realize that the next time they might hear about this person, remember there was no Skype, there was no email, there were no cell phones, there was not even reliable long distance service. And the next time that that person might hear about the person who had raised, their loved one that they had to leave, that um, had raised them, the next time they would hear about them might be a telegram saying that your father has passed away or your mother is very ill. You must return immediately if you are to see her alive again. That is the moment of truth that each of these people had to, to, to face. That is the moment of sacrifice that each of them had to make in order for us to even be here today. And it's when you think of all that they had to do with absolutely nothing, it's a reminder that all the things that we deal with today are so 
minuscule compared to what they had to face. They did all that they did so that we would not have to worry about such things. We would have a better life for us here. And it's up to us to make the most of the sacrifice that they made for us. And I want to leave you with this epi the epilogue to the book, which is written by Richard Wright, one of the great novelists of the 20th century, uh, from whom the title of the book comes, and who was the, the bard of the Great Migration. And in some ways, he, in his words, speaks to anyone who has ever faced the choice, the tough, heartbreaking choice to leave the only place they've ever known for a place they've never seen. But also, it's a message to all of us, in some ways, from the ancestors saying that if they could do what they did, then we should too. And this is what he said. All of us embarking on any difficult decision, whether it's to go back to school or to um, marry this person or marry that person or to take up a new career, whatever it might be, this is what he said. I was leaving the South to fling myself into the unknown. I was taking a part of the South to transplant in alien soil to see if it could grow differently, if it could drink of new and cool rains, bend in strange winds, respond to the warmth of other suns, and perhaps to bloom. And that is a message that's coming from the ancestors, I feel. And they're saying to us that whatever we're going through now, however difficult it may be, it's nothing compared to what they had gone through, and that they have bequeathed us the answers to almost everything that we might face. They're saying, essentially, go for it. Jump off that cliff into the unknown. Because if we could do it with absolutely nothing, there's nothing that you can't do. Thank you very much for having me, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you for your talk. I had a uh, question about, you talked about 1970 when the migration ended. And I was wondering if this is, did it end then because things improved in the South, because there was new mi immigrant labor from outside the United States? Um, what, was, what was the reason that 1970 was the, the year that it ended? Uh, 1970 was the first decennial after the uh, passage of both Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 1968. And it was after the passage of those laws that those, those laws ended the formal caste system that the people had been living under. And as a result of that, the, the, the overarching reason, the uh, universal reason for the people feeling the need to leave was no longer there. And if, in other words, the people had been Southern. In fact, many of the Northerners who are in the North now, many African Americans, are essentially a Southern people in the North. They've maintained the uh, much of much of the culture. Um, you know, the, even some of the accents may be Southern in some parts of, of, of Northern cities. And so a lot of that has been maintained. So the, the, the people, many people d did not necessarily want to go. They felt they had no choice but to go. And those who, uh, when the essential conditions that had propelled the migration to begin uh, uh, to start with were no longer in place, were no longer there holding the people back, then there was no need for the people to leave in such large numbers as they had before. The people spoke with their feet. You know, John Dollard said that um, when there is no other option, the, the, the Yale anthropologist said that when there are no other options, sometimes the most aggressive thing a person can do is to leave, which is what these people did. When there was no need further for them to leave for the same reasons that, that many generations before them had left, then that was when the migration ended. And um, you know, it has been it has been many years, 41 years now since this migration ended, and it has been uh, a slow and incremental 
favoring of the South when it comes to the black population now. It's been incremental, and now it's at about 57 percent. So. Was there no longer a, a need for the labor in the North, or did they find another source for the labor, or there just wasn't the jobs that was drawing them as well? I mean, what did the North do since blacks started mi stopped migrating North? I'm sorry, uh, what was the last part of the question? Well, what was it, if, if blacks stopped migrating north because they preferred to stay in the south, then what, hap what about the northern industry? What did they do for the labor? Or was there just no jobs left anymore that it was needed? Well, you know, uh, life is much more incremental than no jobs in the north and all jobs in the south. I mean, there's still jobs in the north. And ultimately, you know, you have the migration began in uh, 1916. Uh, so you have, you have three generations of people who were in the North, three generations of people who had been born and or raised in the North, and you have now, uh, you had by 1970, a core group of people who were Northerners. They were Southern, you know, in culture, but, they, but their experience was that of the North. And um, <clears throat> the North is large. The North is very diverse. Um, you know, deindustrialization notwithstanding, and you know the 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 large number of people who are here already are were were going to for the most part most of them are staying, and then the migration was no longer needing to happen, and so the people who were there already were staying. I mean, the thing about it is the migration takes great effort. It takes great effort, and people have to have a very strong reason for leaving. That strong reason for leaving, meaning the caste system, was no longer in effect. And it was then and only then that the migration ended. Um, the North will always have an allure for many, many people. And the South will have an allure for many, many others who want to who wanna have uh, you know, more land and more space and want to be able to connect with, for African Americans, connect with their original uh, uh, ancestral homeland, you might say. Africa is where ultimately the people had come originally, but the, the distances have been, it's been so many centuries since African Americans have been in the United States that for many, many generations, the South is a place people have to go to in, or, in order to understand uh, their roots and genealogy, and there's enough work to be done when it comes to that. So there will always be a draw to the South, whether people choose to live there or not. Um, the South, American, uh, African Americans are American, and beyond all of that, they are human, and that means that they do what any other human beings do, and they do what any other Americans do. So a good number of, of, of Americans of all backgrounds are going to the more um, vibrant economy of the Sun Belt, and African Americans are doing that as well. They have multiple reasons for doing it. One, the economy for the, the last couple of decades has been favoring the South, because the South had farther to go. It's almost like you think of an emerging, uh, emerging country has much farther growth. There's much more growth potential in a place that's not as well, it's not as well developed. You don't have, all, there's plenty of room for growth in many places such as Charlotte and Atlanta. And that growth is gonna attract people of all backgrounds to the South, and that's exactly what's happened. In fact, the changes in the South that were wrought as a result of the mass defection of, of the workers, of, of the cheapest labor of the South, meaning African Americans in the Great Migration, which then put pressure on the South to change through the ultimate, uh, the ultimate uh, uh, situation, meaning the Civil Rights Movement, actually made the South a more welcoming place for people of all backgrounds, regardless of their race, black, white, uh, Latino, all of the, the South has benefited in multiple ways, not just from African Americans returning. And so African Americans, being American, are doing what other Americans are doing too. They have an additional uh, connection that, that makes it even more uh, 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 attractive to them, and that's because for many people, they're actually going to a place where they actually have relatives already. Many, almost every African American in the North has some relative somewhere in the South, if they were to look far enough. And so there's a connection that way. Um, uh, this, mi this migration, as with any migration, there is an economic component, but the great migration, which was a seismic shift in American culture, American politics, and in, uh, uh, in the, the legal status of African Americans in this country, was primarily a defection from a caste system that was in some ways a seeking of political asylum within the borders of their own country. And when, the, when, that, when that region stabilized after the civil rights era, 
there was no longer the need for the outpouring of people. Those who had not wanted to leave, and there were some who were never going to leave anyway because it takes a certain kind of person to leave, uh, there was no need for them to leave in the same numbers. And now it's favoring the South because the South has a lot of growth potential that the North did not have. So that's my general sense, sense of that. Yes. Thank you very much for sharing your insight on this uh, episode of American history. Your, your, your words are captivating. The, the road was mean. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I've studied this as well as my colleagues, and one thing that appears to occur with regard to this great migration is this matter of the disillusion of the African-American family in the North. Both the nuclear family and the extended family are at a rate more rapidly than in the South. Would you care to comment on that? Well, first of all, the, um, the, the people who participated in the Great Migration, the actual people who migrated, uh, there's been a lot of misconception about who those people were and what their lives were truly like. And it turns out that the census data show that those people who had come from the South and came to the North were actually more likely to be married and to, re be re and to remain married. They were more likely to be raising their children in two-parent households. They were more likely to be working than those who, than the African Americans, small though those numbers might have been, who were here in the North already. That is a, a revolutionary way of looking at a population that's been so misunderstood through the decades. And this is not from um, my research, this comes from my research into the archival work that had been done by demographers and sociologists and census analysts. Uh, people who are absolute actual experts in this data and this data alone. And I was stunned to read uh, that reality. What the data show is that the North, uh, in its um, not very open welcome to the people who arrived, the concentration, the forced concentration into certain areas of the, of the cities, creating what we call hypersegregation. The most segregated cities in the country, demographers have found, are those cities that um, were in the north that these people had fled to for political asylum. The places they had fled to for asylum actually rejected them by forcing them into, into narrow bands of neighborhoods which are recognizable to anyone who ever visits any major American city. This was not the result of the Great Migration. This was the result of the reaction to the Great Migration. That's a big difference. The people who came, came with the desire to work. Why did they come with the desire to work? They knew nothing but work. They had worked from sun up to sundown for nothing, for generations. They had known nothing but work, and something about migrants and immigrants in general. Immigrants and migrants come from so far away, and they have so much at stake, and they have so little safety net, because the people back home are, are looking to them for help. They're looking to them to see how well they will make it. They cannot help them. The people who are the sharecroppers who stayed back home or the people who were uh, taking in laundry or the people who were domestics back home who were making maybe a dollar a day, if that, or, or uh, for picking 100 or 200 pounds of, of cotton, they could not help the people when they were up in the big cities having to face uh, outrageous rents uh, and, and all the cost of living in these crowded tenements. The fact of the matter is that in these neighborhoods that the African Americans were forced to live in when they came in the Great Migration, they were paying as much as two and three times per month for rent as their, um, uh, uh, as their counterparts, recent arrivals from Eastern and Southern Europe who were in other parts of the city. They were paying many times more for less space dilapidated housing owned by, um, land, by uh, uh, absentee landlords who were wringing them dry and taking advantage of them. And they had no option because they could not get out of those ghettos. Every time they tried to, they were facing 
uh, uh, fire bombings. They were facing restrictive covenants. Even for white people who wanted to sell to them, they could not sell. The only way they were going to get out is if there was someone who would buy it for them under pretense, and then they would buy it from that person. That was the only way they could get out. And even then, they were facing bombings, fire bombings, and other kinds of violence here in the North. And so their circumstances were dire indeed. Their children, as with the children of other immigrant groups that have a little bit more difficult time making, getting into the mainstream, there are many groups, for example, when there are large numbers, for example, in South Boston. South Boston is a part of Boston, which is, has a very high concentration of Irish, of Irish Americans, not all of whom have, uh, have assimilated into full American culture. They've not, not, not been able to make that assimilation. There are, there are in South Boston gangs that are the, from the descendants of the people who had migrated many generations ago. There are other groups that, that are very well known as, as having the children who have a difficult time adjusting to the harsh, forbidding, and unforgiving cities, anonymous cities, where there is all kinds of, of people preying on them and picking at these people, at the children, while the parents are working hard to be able to afford to live in the most expensive cities in the country. Little did we know, a little of those people know, that when they made this great migration, they migrated to the most expensive parts of the country. Yes, they were making more money, but that money was not going far when you're living in the most expensive part of the country. New York, Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles, all these places are tremendously more expensive. They could not go out and kill a chicken like they could back home because they had to go and buy the chicken. And that chicken was going to be way more expensive, maybe more than they would have made in a day back in the South. So the adjustment to the North, a hostile, forbidding place that was difficult for anyone, but particularly for someone who was off of, just off of the farm, made it difficult for all of them. And then finally, one of the great tragedies of the 20th century, indeed one of, to me, the great tragedies that helped lead to the hypersegregation that plagued so many cities in the North, is the fact that the cities, Detroit, Cleveland, Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Louis. Those are the cities that are considered to be hyper-segregated. And they are hyper-segregated because of the great tragedy that occurred during the 20th century. And that tragedy was that these cities, because of the, uh, uh, the jobs that were uh, made it possible for people with all these dreams to make a living for themselves, the people were coming from all over the world. They were coming from Lithuania. They were coming from Poland. They were coming from Ireland. They were coming from parts of Asia. But pr primarily, they were coming from Europe to this country, and they were coming from the South within this country. And they got to these cities. One group was invited into the unions and permitted in the unions. The other group had a more difficult time. Some were not permitted in the unions at all. Some were brought in as strike breakers. That is no way to begin building bridges. That's no way to begin building bridges. This is the result of how the people were brought in to these cities at the time that the cities needed these workers. And so these people were pitted against one another. These people were the same people. They were the same people. They were both people of the land, whether they had come from southern Italy or parts of Poland, or parts of Mississippi, or parts of Alabama. They were people of the land. They were far, far from home. They had left everything, and they were in a position where they could not fail. They had to do whatever it took to feed themselves and their families. They had no safety net because they were too far from home, and the people back home couldn't help them. So here they were in a forbidding, hostile place, pitted against one another on the basis of how one group looked and how the other group looked, and they were the same people. I'm haunted by the great tragedy that occurred in the 20th century, and I'm hopeful that somehow by recognizing that, we can get past that somehow, because we are still living with the legacy of that. And these people and the descendants of these people are all people who are descended from people who made a great, courageous move for, on behalf of their children. And I hope that we can all see that we all have so much more in common than we've been led to believe. Any other questions? Um, thank you, 
Miss Wilkerson, I read your book, and um, I'd like everybody to read it. I bought five I copies. Would too. <laughs> <laughs> I bought five copies to give to family and friends. But I was wondering, how did you take care of yourself while you were writing the book? It seems very emotional. I have two other questions. Um, um, what was, you know, how did you change um, up, upon completion? And then what are, what is the most common feedback from American whites and American <laughs> blacks and then maybe people from other countries? Hey, first of all, to answer your second question, that is the most common question I get from both sides. Um, African Americans want to know what white people are saying and white people want to know what black people are saying. <laughs> I find that fascinating. Um, uh, essentially, both sides, in, in an odd kind of way, are saying the same thing. They're saying, I never knew. I never knew. There are a lot of people, this migration is so, it's, it's, so, it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's, it is it's omnipresent. It is present in the uh, embodiment of almost every African American that you might meet in the North and the West. And it's something that everybody thinks they know about because it is everywhere. And yet, um, I, can, I can guarantee you, and it's hard to hear it from me because I'm the one who wrote the book, that you have no idea. I'm the daughter of people who were part of the Great Migration. I had no idea, no idea. First of all, that no one could possibly have an idea because the people didn't talk. I mean, one of the most difficult interviews I had was with my mother. I mean, it wasn't one interview. I'd talk with people over the course of years, but she did not want to talk, absolutely did not want to talk. You know, that's, that's ancient history. Why do you want to drag that out, uh, drag that up again? There's nothing to say, I left. That's all she said. Now, that's not getting me very far. But over time, um, I, you know, I, I read her parts of the book, and it got to the point where I would read parts of the book, and she would start interrupting to say, well, when I was in Rome, and I always like to say, you know, my mother's from Rome, and people say, really? And then I say, George, and they say, oh. But anyway, she would say, but when I was in Rome, so she'd start interrupting, and that's one of the ways that I found out about my own family story. The reason I can say I never knew, and that therefore most Americans do not know, do not know what happened within our own country during the 20th century when it comes to the cities and how they came to be, what was going on in the South and how we're all affected by it, is because the people did not talk about it. How could you know if no one was talking about it? And the, how difficult it was to get the people to talk about it was very difficult and very emotional for many of these people. These people uh, had, were, you know, the, those who decided to eventually talk, these three people who were brave enough to, to and, and were at the right point in their lives to talk, uh, you know, became the heart and soul representing all the people who had been silent for so long because they felt the need, I guess, at that point. They felt the peace within themselves to be able to talk about it. But it took a great deal to talk, for get, to get them to talk about it. And that was probably the most difficult aspect of it. Um, how did I get through it would be basically, I, I, took, I took great um, solace in the people themselves. If you get a chance to read the book, you will see that they are beautiful and amazing people. They are characters unto themselves. They are not perfect and they don't pr present themselves as perfect. One reason why I think people have uh, uh, attached themselves to the book so much is because they are openly who they are, how they are, warts and all. And, and that's a, a lovely gift that they have given to all of us as they talk about the, the struggles and the heartbreak and the decisions that they had to make and how they made those decisions. But what sustained me was them. Uh, one of them, you know, was saying to me at one point, you know, if you don't finish this book soon, you, I'm going to be proofreading from heaven. That gives you an idea of the kind of people they were. Um, they, they, they were, they had a way of seeing the world that we could all learn from, a sense of fortitude and determination. These people had lived through some of the worst things that one's country can throw at you. These people had, had, had seen or heard of people that they knew who were lynched. They themselves experienced uh, attacks often because they were so common. And one of the things that wasn't mentioned about how you don't know, I say I'd never knew. Uh, there are references, a few references to my own family in the book. Not a lot because the story, the book is not about my family. I wanted it to be clear that it's not about one person. It's about an entire movement of people who, uh, through the power of the individual, they did not make the decision 
uh, as part of a movement. They, in fact, don't even view themselves as part of a movement. You ask someone, were you part of the Great Migration? They'd say, I don't know. I don't think I was. I came from Mississippi to Chicago in 1947. And that's right in the middle of the Great Migration, statistically. But they don't think of that. Immigrants and migrants and people who make this kind of life-altering change in their lives do it because it is the best thing for them at the moment, at that time, and the circumstances in which they're living. And the, and the beauty and the most inspiring thing about it is the power of the individual. These individuals, one by one by one, by what they did, altered an election in 1940 of one of our best known and beloved presidents. They helped change music and culture as we know it. They, they helped, helped to move forward the country when it comes to the civil rights movement and the, and the, and the ancillary uh, uh, movements that have come as a result of that, meaning uh, other kinds of movements for the disabled, for, for uh, gay rights, for women's rights, all these things in Vietnam, all these things were coming at the same time. There's a general, a general sense of, of unease and recognition that something was not right and things needed to, to be made right. And it was, this migration was one of the great silent things that was going on in the 20th century that was putting pressure on the North and the South to ultimately confront something it had not dealt with in centuries. Now, the reason I say that people don't know about it, and of course, there are many ups, there are many amazing, <laughs> there are amazing things that people talk about. It is not all about lynchings. It's about the maintaining of the culture, too. There's a crisis that, that one of the characters has where she's, she's Ida Mae, she's in the North, She's been making cornbread from the way she can remember in her memory that her grandmother made. And um, it turns out that she's, her daughter goes south. She's been in the north now for 40 years. Her daughter comes back and says, you know, they're not making cornbread like you make it anymore. They're using self-rising meal. They're not making it from scratch anymore. And she says, well, I don't even know how to make that. And so they set out on this journey to go to the Jewel Food Store to find the self-rising meal. She said, well, if that's what they're doing back home, I guess I should try it. And I told a, a friend of mine, a fellow professor who's, who's Italian-American, a professor of, of Italian, and she was saying, that's just how it is with us. You know, we're trying to make the pasta from scratch, and we're doing all this. And then when we go to Italy, we see they're not doing that. They're buying it off the shelf. <laughs> it's the same thing. In other words, this is about the human story of how you transfer a culture, how you survive, how you make a way out of no way, and how you attempt to make the best of a difficult lot no matter where you happen to be. But getting back to the idea of you did not know, the references to things in my family in the book, as an example, I had no idea. I had, my mother had never told me every single reference, and they're not that many, but the few references that are in there, one involving the Klan, I had never known, ever, had not told until I began working on the book. So many things I hear from people, you ask, what do people say? They say they never knew, just simply never knew. They had been majors in history, they had majored in history. They had um, been reading history all these, you know, all these years. They had taught history, and yet they never knew because these are stories that had not been told because the people had not talked about it. It had been too painful. It had been too heartbreaking. And then some, some things are, are, are heartbreakingly humorous. I mean, they're so absurd as to be, for us now, to just have to just almost, you, you almost want to laugh because it's just that absurd. But these are things that they had not shared with, with people. And so to answer your question, the, the, I get this question from everyone, but the answer is always the same. And I think that's a reminder of how much we actually have in common. Before we get to that question, just to let you guys know that there are books for sale down here, and there's also some food out in the lobby. I want you to eat enough for 10 people on your way out, okay? <laughs> all right, last question. Okay, so thank you tonight for being here, first of all, and taking your time to come talk to us in our uh, Grand Rapids. And my question is, what gave you the ambition to writing this book? And correct me if I'm wrong, but you said it took you 15 years to write it. Um, why did it take you that long? And also, uh, why is it based on solely um, immigration? On what? Is it immigration, you said? Immigration? Yes. Migration, excuse me. Oh, migration. Sorry. Um, uh, the, the first and the third question are kind of uh, related, and that is that um, this migration 
um, changed American culture as we know it, um, changed the political landscape as we know it, um, and had yet not been written about to the degree that it deserved to have been written about. It should be more than a paragraph or two in your standard US history book. It deserves far more than that, um, given the impact that it's had. There's hardly any work of African American literature, uh, theater, or music that does not have some direct connection or does not merely exist as a result of what happened and is described in this book, meaning the migration of, of, of both the people and the culture from the South to the North. That's one thing. It is one of the largest internal migrations that's ever occurred within the borders of our country. And yet there had been no big, there had been no book that had looked at the experiences of how they made the decision, why they made the decision on a national scale following the three major streams of this migration and following it from beginning to the end and looking at it from talking to the people before it was too late. These people were getting up in years. This migration began in World War I. It ended in 1970. And each year, these people are part of, these people are uh, part of the greatest generation that we often refer to. The greatest generation being those people who were, you know, born into war, World War I, raised during the Depression, then went and fought World War II. These are some of the most courageous people of the greatest generation. And they had been, in some ways, rejected by their own country, certainly by their own, the homeland, the, the land into which they had been born. And yet their story had not been told from, from the perspective of understanding, talking to them, and hearing what they had gone through. And then putting that in the larger context of other things that were going on in the world at the time that they were living through this. And uh, this migration in, involved six million Americans. Um, who helped change the country as we know it, and, and the, yet there was no grapes of wrath for this migration. I am not saying that this book is the grapes of wrath. The grapes of wrath is fiction. It's a masterpiece by Steinbeck, and I'm not saying that that's what this is, but there was nothing, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a fiction writer, so I could not have even attempted to do something like that, but I could, as a journalist, go out and talk with the people and write it to the best of my ability to make it come alive for the reader, which is what I seek to do through the lives of these three protagonists. This migration deserved that because it had had such an effect and there were six million people involved and the majority of African Americans in the North and the West are descended from it and the majority of people in the North and the West know someone who was a part of this great migration and if they don't even know anyone, they have it in their music library, on their shelves or been to plays. There's no way to escape the culture that grew out of the great migration because the great migration culture is essentially American 20th century culture. And then, um, the, but the, the, the Dust Bowl migration, which is what the uh, Grapes of Wrath documents, involved 300,000 people. It went on from about 1934 to 1939. It went on for about five years, five or six years, the 1930s. This migration went on for three generations. It involved six million people. And yet there was nothing that documented this massive internal migration that occurred within our own country. So that is the reason why um, I chose to write about it. And then uh, finally, why did it take so long? The book is essentially almost three books in one. It is the stories of three different people who each could be a book unto their own. Um, Dr. Foster, for one thing, who was a physician who became, um, he became the physician to Ray Charles and uh, he was an inveterate gambler and just a character unto himself. He could be a book on his own. And um, then there's the additional research that means going through all the archives. So actually, uh, given all of the work that had to go into it, 15 years was worth it and really not that long. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>